Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Up the Ladder for the Sport Professional Knowledge Network. As always, I'm Nate Stein, and joining me today is a titan in the sports media world. He's worked in journalism for over 15 years, started in traditional media, TV, radio, newspaper, moved on to ESPN, the worldwide leader, working in their stats and info department for over 10 years, including three World Cups on site, and now the for the past four plus years at True Media, creating analytics websites for uh, professional teams, college teams, and media. Paul Carr from True Media. Paul, thank you so much for joining me on Up the Ladder. Uh, you bet, Nate. Good to talk to you. So Paul and I got to know each other a little bit uh, when I was a student at Wheaton. He is an alum, so I'm very grateful for the guidance that Paul has given me throughout my life. But Paul, I want to dive right into True Media. And if you could just kind of give us a rundown of what True Media does and where you fit into that whole cog, that would be amazing. You bet. Yeah, so True Media... Our, we basically create analytics websites for teams, for media, and the goal is to take all their information and turn it into a site that's easy to use. So you don't have to know how to program or code or write queries to be able to get information out. So baseball's a good example. They have tons of data. Uh, obviously, there's the traditional stats. There's everything that comes with the new StatCast era, you know, launch angle and exit velocity and pitch location, spin rate, and all these things. And instead of having to know how to write advanced queries to figure out what's well, a guy slugging against right-handed fastballs, we've created a website. So it's a couple of clicks and you can both see a heat map and get the data. So, you know, some players, coaches are not, they don't want to see a table of data. They mm -hmm. would rather see a heat map or a spray chart. So we have outputs that are like that and we can automate a lot of that. So instead of taking hours every day before a game to prep for an opponent, you can automate the heat maps, the spray charts, the data that you want, and it's available and it gets you to video faster, things along those lines. So that's kind of a, a microcosm of what we do. It's a little different for every sport and different clients, but basically we're taking all your data and turning it into something that you can easily use and get the information you want in better ways and faster ways. So there you go. Every time on TV or whenever you're watching a sports broadcast, whenever they pull out those stats, like, oh, when he's in this count, a 2-1 count right. with two outs, runners on first and second, this is average. That's you guys putting all that together and mapping that. Yep. Yeah. Sometimes it makes it easy to, yeah, it's just easier. You know, there's yeah. lots of different ways you can do it. But again, I don't have a programming and coding background. I know some basics. I couldn't pull that out of a raw feed, but we give, you know, normal people in that sense, uh, the easy ability to be able to find info that they're looking for. So when did you know you wanted to do something like this, whether it's analytics or just sports in general? Yeah. So I started on a media track, I would call it just because 20 years ago, when I was getting ready to go to college, like there was no sports analytics field. Moneyball had not been written. Nobody, it just wasn't really a thing. Uh, so when I was in high school, I went to a sports casting camp run by a guy at my church at Kansas State. And that's where I kind of was, I like doing this. So I went to Wheaton. I was a comms major, a communications major, did a ton of radio, uh, newspaper, et cetera, there, and planned to get into the media world. So that's what I did when I got out of school. Uh, worked a radio, TV, newspaper back in Topeka, where I'm from, and did that for a few years and then kind of stumbled on the ESPN research job. Uh, and I was always, always good with numbers, you know, yeah. just retained information. Well, you know, thought about majoring in math or minoring in math or something. And it just didn't, didn't work out the way it could have, could have, should have definitely different than it would now, if I were going yeah. to school now, uh, so the ESPN job worked out and that was kind of a perfect blend of my media background, my sports love, my, uh, love for numbers. And then over that decade, even just ESPN analytics just blew up both mm -hmm. from a team standpoint and from a media usage standpoint. And it had a lot of emphasis at ESPN, having their own stats and information department, starting an analytics department. So it just, I was in the right place at the right time in that sense. And that evolved uh, eventually after 10 years there to come to True Media, which was a partner with ESPN. So I knew the company, I knew the product extremely well, uh, and that made a good fit. And so I can work from home, you know, more normal hours than media jobs tend to be, which is great for me. And that's where I'm at now. So I want to talk about that transition from kind of normal traditional media into the more analytics period, because looking at the timeline, you started at ESPN about 15 years ago. That's right at the onset of, yeah. oh, analytics are coming into kind of the main focus of the like big media, we'll call right. it, normal fan who's watching sports. What was that like being on the cutting edge of that? And what was the learning process transitioning from just pure media to kind of that combination? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it was taking the same skill sets that I had. It was, all right, as a researcher, you know, my job is often to find that note, find that 
uh, the last time, you know, the Royals hit a walk-off home run the ninth inning when they were down two runs, you know, mm-hmm. finding those notes that tell the story and translating that into just more advanced numbers. So instead of saying it's a quarterback's highest completion percentage or something like that, which is a good note and might be useful, uh, from an ESPN standpoint, they developed a total QBR metric, which is a better version of NFL's passer rating. And now you can say, look, it's his best QBR, which means it's beyond the completion percentage. You could have good completion percentage game and you're just dropping it off to the running back. And that doesn't tell you a lot, but if you look at QBR, uh, it tells more of the story. It factors in, you know, getting first downs, first downs you get with your legs. For example, you know, Patrick Mahomes always seems to pick up like three of those a game, which mm-hmm. helps his QBR. Michael Vick was the poster child when QBR was developed because he added so much beyond just throwing the ball. So it lets you tell, you know, in some ways it's the same stories you're telling. This guy was good. This guy was bad. This team is struggling. And it gives you more in your toolbox to tell those stories. So in some ways it was straightforward. You know, you get good metrics, you get good data. And you're just using it in the same ways that you've been using it. Uh, But having those just more ways to do things and more tools in the toolbox, just like it, you know, if you were a construction worker, having more tools helps you do more stuff when you're building something. It's kind of the same thing in TV. You've got all these different tools, these different weapons, which can help you tell these stories in better ways. So what's something you learned uh, maybe in your time at Wheaton or when you were in uh, media in Topeka that you feel like set you up really well moving forward to ESPN and kind of the career path transition that you experienced there? Yeah, I think part of it, you know, you work in media, you have limited time mm-hmm. on the air. You know, obviously that changes with podcasts and, and things where there's a little less concrete time, but especially, you know, you work in radio, you've got a three minute segment here or a one minute segment to get in the local sports update, or even you're doing a game, you're doing a football game. You've got your 30, 45 seconds between plays to make your point, to transition to the next thing, to get in this live read, whatever it is. And so you've got to be concise with your language. And it's, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, get DSPN, you've got 10 seconds of copy to write for this graphic. So you've got to be concise. You've got to get your point across quickly. And same thing, just having normal conversations. If you're in a meeting, you know, we've all been in meetings that are twice as long as they should be. Uh, and you try to be concise, get your point across. And so I think that's part of it. You work on this time constraints and that helped me at least try to get those points across quickly and try to cut words out and things like that. that. That's such an interesting parallel to draw between actually being on air and then writing something for somebody being on air. I, I have a ton of experience being on air. That, that's what my background's in before I got to SBKN. Mm-hmm. So, so it really is interesting to think about how you do need to be concise when you're setting somebody up for that position. I, I've never yeah. had a, a stats person in my back pocket, so right. I haven't gotten to experience that. But man, when I've loved to have True Media sending me stuff before right. all the games that I've called. And right. If I'm writing a note on a card, you know, I do this, still do this. I'm in the booth of a game mm-hmm. and I'm writing notes on the cards and handing it to them. I can't write full sentences. I can't fill up a whole card. It's got to be, what is the note? Because the announcers both has to be able to read it, instantly understand it and instantly relay it to somebody. So it's got to be, you know, I could have the best note in the world, but if it takes 20 seconds to read and then 20 seconds, like it's not getting on air. Yeah. So sometimes you can save those for maybe half time when you're off air and you have time to explain something and it can get worked in a different way. But if it's, you know, even if it's just simple, like fourth straight game with a goal. Yeah. Like super simple note useful. That's all you need. You don't need to get into the details of in that 10 seconds of what the specifics are. So you got to work in those constraints and be concise. Sure. And I'm sure it helps that obviously these guys are paying close attention to the game. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to add too much context. They should know who you're referring to when you're writing down stats. So I want to talk, you got into a little bit of what you do kind of not day-to-day, but when you're working games, what does that day-to-day look like for you? You get up, you go to work, maybe not a game day, uh, just on an off day. Yeah, no, a typical day for me here at True Media is kind of a mix of several different things. And it obviously varies depending on the the day and the season and and what's on the agenda in general. Uh, So I oversee our our content team and our client support team, which is more or less the same people. But so we're, we are answering questions, you know, we get email questions, hey, how do I do this on your website? I'm trying to do this, uh, this might be broken. So it's answering those questions. Sometimes it's real simple, send them a link. Sometimes, you know, it's jump on a call so they can explain what they're talking about. Sometimes there's a bug, we need to talk to our engineers and figure out how we're going to fix it. So there's client support, uh, there's doing demos, there's a lot of, you know, we're always looking for new clients, whether it's new baseball teams, college baseball teams, media clients. So there's a lot of 
I'm going to do a call. I'm going to show you the site. I'm going to answer your questions, that sort of thing. Uh, there's the content side is, you know, preparing game notes. We do game notes support for Fox, especially soccer, MLS, World Cup, things like that. Uh, and there's also other internal and external content, whether it's documenting things. Here's how you use this feature on our site. Here's uh, ways that here's a video of how to do it. Here's a, a file that shows you with screenshots. Uh, we have a podcast, Expected Value, that talks to analytics people that we have. And, you know, there's a bit of a social and corporate website maintenance type of stuff, too. So a lot of internal, external content, a lot of handling clients. Those are kind of the main two to four buckets that I'm working on every day. Okay. So a lot of interpersonal communication, talking mm -hmm. with people. So you probably have some pretty good answers for this next question I'm going to ask you. What's something that's happened to you while you've been on the job where if you told the story, nobody would ever believe it, but obviously you were there. So you know, it happened. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole bunch of specifics. I'll, I'll give you the broad category first. Broadly, it's just working with people you see on TV. You know, mm -hmm. you're Bob Lee, uh, Julie Foudy, Alexi Lawless. You know, for me, it was a lot of soccer people, yeah. especially, but even just, you know, almost any sports center anchor. Um, and not just, so first of all, there's something to that because for 99% of people, you see them on TV and that's it. You know, you don't yeah. interact with them ever. And so it's kind of hanging out with it, but it's even more, it's the off the air things, especially in remotes, you know, it's, we just did a game and now we're at a rooftop bar with you know, a former US player, a famous broadcaster, uh, somebody else on the crew. And, and we're just discussing, you know, someone's going to propose to his girlfriend and this one's having relationship issues and just talking through these normal things with, yeah. you know, people that are relatively known sometimes it's just like, this is just weird. Or, mm -hmm. you know, one of my first couple months, I found myself in the green room at ESPN. It was ended up just being me and John Harks and we we're just talking soccer. And, you know, three months earlier, I was working at a radio station in Topeka. It's just weird situations like that, or I'm in Frankfurt for the women's world cup and Tony DeChico, who used to coach the women's national team mm -hmm. finds like the best Italian restaurant in Frankfurt, because that's what he does. <laughs> and it's he, it's Bob Lee, it's me and John Costa, another researcher. And we're having dinner at an Italian place with Tony DeChico and Bob Lee. And it's just <laughs> like this, it's just kind of surreal that, yeah. so it's in some way they're mundane things. It's, mm -hmm. it's lunch, it's drinks, it's dinner, it's hanging out but with different people and in different places that you get these unique experiences that I never really expected to get. Yeah. I love that about sports and especially working in media. Cause obviously you see these people, they look like, well, they are famous, but they look like yeah. they're larger than life. They're on your TV. And most people these days have a 50 inch TV. So they truly look <laughs> larger than yeah, life. Big. And then to your point, they're just, they're normal guys. You get right. off air, you're hanging out. They, they go through struggles in their life just the same as everybody else. They, they put their pants on one leg at a time to use the old line. But that, that's cool. That, that's really interesting. Um, Before we have to wrap up, one thing that we do like to do for every show on SPKN is get a coach story from you. So this could be anything good or bad, something you experience as a player, as a professional, as an employee, as a boss, as a coach yourself. And it can be anything, just something that had an impact on you and that stuck with you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go to this. And this is something that maybe I didn't totally realize as I was kind of growing my career, but it was pointed out to me very early in my ESPN career. And I encourage people now to do this. And that's the importance of having a wide range of skills. Mm -hmm. And that works in a couple different ways. I think part of it is general skills because being a comms and media major, like I was I was a good writer. I had a great uh, writing teacher back in high school. So I was a good writer. Uh, I was comfortable speaking in front of people just because it's the nature of the business, doing radio. It was just, just a very comfortable thing. So both having broad general skills like that, because then I get to ESPN and like people notice, oh, you're good at writing. Oh, you're fine talking to people. That means you can do these presentations for our group. That means you can help edit our blog. That means you can teach others how to do things. Uh, so it wasn't something maybe I intentionally developed, but those general skills are applicable as any communications department will tell you. These general skills you learn in our department are applicable, applicable to whatever job you get. Uh, but then also specific skills. Um, so for radio specifically, I taught myself audio editing at Wheaton because like I couldn't take the class because it didn't work out. Um, so I just taught myself the editing program. And that was kind of the hook that got me my first job. And wow. that's come in handy, you know, doing a podcast here. It, so all these just different 
skills that are a little more tangible, whether it's editing, whether it's learning how to program using R or Python or whatever it is, all these different things. Those are things, having the breadth of skills, especially in job markets where often, you know, it's a little challenging. They need you to do three different things. Mm -hmm. Having that breadth of skills, both general and specific is super valuable. And I always encourage anybody to just expand what you can do as much as possible. Awesome. That's really good advice. And I, I've even experienced that in my role here with SPKN, taking right. on a lot of different things from guest communication to video and audio editing to hosting my own show here with Up the Ladder. Um, Paul, I cannot thank you enough for taking some time out of your day to join me on Up the Ladder today. Everybody, go check out True Media Network, see their work. Go check out Paul on the Expected Value podcast. Paul, thank you so much. You bet, Nate. Good to talk to you.